So I have the recording getting started. All right, we're underway. Because I know that you have some legal related reading to do in this course, I wanted to make sure that you had the correct terminology to give you kind of a glossary of words that you may see that could be confusing and some that I hope will be helpful because a lot of us, maybe all we know about the legal process is what we see in police dramas and courtroom shows on television. I myself had been pre-law prior to changing my major over to communications, so I'd been studying this kind of thing for years, and there were a couple of times in government where I actually had to write laws of Florida or administrative rules of Florida. So I've been involved with this without being a lawyer and many people are. So I want to make sure that you all had access to these important terms. So to read and critique a court case, you need to know a few basic terms and concepts. And I break it into four groups. You need to know the kinds of courts, the kinds of cases, some additional terms, and then the parts of a decision. And decisions are something that are particular to the Supreme Court because they sort of set the standard for what other courts do in the future. So those need to be written out very carefully. And that kind of reading, whether you're reading the decision or you're just reading an article online about the decision, can look kind of complicated, but I think we can break it down into some simple pieces. First, I want you to think about courts as coming in different levels. So I have them here listed from largest or greatest influence down to least. So we have a federal court system that's created in the US Constitution. So the US Supreme Court is a federal court. And there are some specialized courts at the federal level. There are district courts which cover multiple states and those are also federal courts. And then we have a state court system. Every state has its own. So Florida has its own Supreme Court. So it has kind of a, a mirrored structure. And then in Florida, there are circuits, which means multiple counties. Individually, you might have county court. In very large cities, you might have a municipal court system just for New York or Los Angeles something like that. And then sometimes there are specialty courts that just handle particular kinds of cases like traffic, family court for divorces and adoptions and things, juvenile court for minors. Uh, some jurisdictions unfortunately have to have drug courts because they have so many drug offenses within that, that area. So the national level, we have the US Supreme Court and then the federal courts underneath it. And then in Florida or any state, you would have the state Supreme Court and lesser courts underneath it. Most cases start in some local court system and then work their way up, depending upon whether or not one of the parties wants to keep fighting the question. And we'll come to that in a moment. The kinds of courts also have to do with the kind of law that was broken or the law that is at issue. So there are federal laws called statutes. In this one in particular, the book that I'm showing you is about admiralty and maritime law, like salvaging shipwrecks and shipping things commercially across boundaries. So there are legal standards for just about everything that people do, and we collect those cases to understand how to act properly. State laws, so within Florida, those are also called statutes, but local laws use a different word. Those are called ordinances. So things within a city or a county are called ordinances, oftentimes to regulate business activity and safety things. So you might have local ordinances. Then there's another layer of administrative law that isn't really law. Instead, it's regulations that government departments put out, like proper means of construction 
or how to get a license to be a barber or other matters that don't need a law, but do need some sort of system of regulation. Now, I give you the important word here, jurisdiction. That just means where does a certain court have the authority to make decisions? So here in Florida, even if it's a tourist from Georgia, if they have a traffic accident in Florida, they're under Florida law because they're in this state. So we need to be aware of that when traveling around. Any, any of the United States can have some subtle differences about speed limits, the age at which you can do certain things. So there, there are little things that might be different from state to state. So if you travel and you go over a state line, you're under another set of law books than you would be here in Florida. Like here in Florida, you can make a right on red at a traffic light, but in some states you can't do that. So I remember when it first came in that you could do that in Florida, a lot of people just sat there because they didn't know that law had changed. So even little things like that could vary. The federal level or each state will have a Supreme Court and their main job is to consider whether things were constitutional. So just like the U.S. Constitution that you've already seen in this course, there's also a state constitution. So Florida also has a set of guiding principles for how it wants its laws, how it wants its government to be set up, how it wants things to operate. Both the federal and the state have an appeals level of courts so that if you lost but you still think you shouldn't have lost or you have additional evidence or you think the court procedure was improper, you have a chance to appeal. Just like in sports where you can uh, ask the referee to look at the instant replay to prove whether you were right or wrong, an appeals court is a way for you to continue your argument either over procedure or evidence. I give you another special word here called remand. Sometimes a higher court doesn't actually change the verdict, but what they do is they indicate what the mistake was that was made previously, some process that wasn't followed or some piece of evidence that should have been thrown out or included, and they will send the case back down to where it originally was and tell them to do it over with these corrections. So to remand is just to send the case down to be done over with some improvements in the way that it ought to be handled. Then we need to look at the kinds of cases because the kind of case can determine what court you are in also. The easiest way to separate it is criminal or civil. A criminal case would be the state of Florida versus some individual who has committed a crime. Now, this could be a little bit subtle to pick up. If somebody is murdered, we think it's a crime against the person who got killed. But it's a criminal case because it is a crime against the good order of society. There are some things that as a society of people, we do not want to have members of the society getting killed or robbed or any of those things. So while it is a crime against an individual or maybe against uh, some business that did something illegal, it's a criminal case if it offends all of the people taken together as a society. So the major crimes that we think of like murder, assault, theft, even drunk driving because that's an offense against public safety on the highway. Those are crimes and are tried in criminal courts. Civil cases is when it's you suing me or me suing somebody else because there was some loss between the two of us. So if your tree falls over on my car, I probably have to sue you or in your insurance company to get my car fixed. There was no crime that took place, but one of us suffered a loss and the court system is the only way to get that loss recovered. So oftentimes 
we think of traffic traffic accidents as being a classic civil case. Now, should we call it an accident? Really, we should not. When investigating them, we call them crashes because we don't know if it was an accident that a tire blew out or a brake line broke, or was it a situation where the driver was drunk and it was their fault? Or even was it intentional that you rammed into some sign or mailbox because you were mad and, and you did that? So in some of those cases, it wasn't an accident, but it certainly was a crash. And then I give you another uh, specialized term here called a tort. And you may see that in your reading. A tort just means that you have a claim of loss or damages. So if you were unfairly fired from a job, you would have a tort to get your lost wages and to get your job back. If your car was damaged by somebody else, you have a tort to get the car repaired or replaced. So tort just means you lost something and you're going to make an argument that you ought to get paid back. But that's a specialized word that you might see. A few other terms because they have to do with how you would read a case. The plaintiff is always the person who comes first. And we use that word because they are complaining about something. Something was done wrong either to society or to them as an individual, and they're bringing a complaint about what harm they suffered. Then the defendant is the person who was on defense, who was accused of causing this loss to take place. And any time you see a case written, the first name is going to be the plaintiff. The second name is always going to be the defendant. So whoever is bringing the problem is first, and whoever is defending the problem is second. In court, the evidence that's presented, and we've already had lessons about argumentation, is the proof of your position. Could be documents, could be eyewitnesses, could be photographs, could be many number of things. Oftentimes, these are going to be facts. The only exception to that would be expert opinion. So if you bring in a witness who is a particular expert about the engineering of automobiles to talk about the car accident and why it happened, that person's opinion is considered factual evidence because this person is trained, educated, licensed, and recognized as an expert in that field. Now, could the auto engineer testify to the injuries that somebody suffered? No, you would need a doctor to talk about that because it's different training, different kind of expertise. But most of the time, the evidence is going to be physical, tangible documents. It's going to be shell casings and blood samples and all of that. Another thing to consider is how serious is the case? This is particular with criminal cases. So a misdemeanor is considered a minor case. So little things like um, drunken disorderly or minor drug possession, those are things that could be punished just with less than a year in the county jail and a fine, I think, less than $10,000 in Florida. So unless the crime is really, really bad, you might be able to just pay the fine or do a short amount of time in a local jail. If it's a felony, if it's grand theft, if it's major drug dealing, if it's a major personal crime like rape or murder, that person is going to go to a state level prison for over a year. And that's kind of our dividing line between misdemeanor and felony. Do they get locked up locally for less than a year? Or do they get locked up at a state facility for over a year? And then very few cases are capital cases, meaning that the ultimate penalty could be death. Treason against the United States is a potential death penalty case. Some levels of terrorism are death penalty cases. So that gives you three levels of severity 
as to the kind of case that it might be, and we tend to classify them by the level of punishment it would receive if they were found guilty. Now, to the decision itself, and this is a particular thing with Supreme Court cases, because when the Supreme Court decides guilty or innocent, they will also write a lengthy essay about why they took this case in whichever direction. And we want to read what they were thinking because that will guide lower courts when something like that comes up themselves. So if the U.S. Supreme Court decides a case about guns or abortion or whatever, the way that they came to their decision, the research that they used, the previous cases that they considered, what part of the arguments of the different lawyers that they thought were stronger or weaker, they write that up into the essay, which is called a decision. And that helps people understand not just who won or lost, but why. Now, the majority of the court, let's say there are nine members and five vote one way, four vote the other. The five would be the majority and they would work together on the essay called the opinion that explains why that group voted that way. Sometimes you will have one of those five decide he wants to write his own essay because he agreed with the outcome, but he had a different reasoning and how he came to it. So he agreed with the overall answer, but he had other research or other logic. There were other cases in his mind. There were other principles. So he concurs. I agree with the group, but I have a different idea about how we should have gotten there. So we want to read that as well because that gives us another way of understanding. Even the losers get to say their opinion. So of the four people who voted the other way and lost, they will write what's called a dissent, their disagreement. And they'll explain why they thought their idea was correct and the other judges were wrong. And you might have more than one of them because some of them may have felt strongly that they should disagree for a different reason. Reading the dissents is also important because over time society changes its ideas about things or circumstances change so that what might have been a losing argument a hundred years ago could be a winning argument today. So understanding why sides win and lose are both important. I'll give you a couple more terms. Precedent. Notice the way that that's spelled. It is not like President of the United States. See how it has the word precede tucked in there. It means that previous cases that are similar to this, that give us ideas and logic that we could reuse to put together our new idea, we like to reuse them because we give, we give credit to previous courts for also having done an honest and thorough job in whatever they studied. So if we can lean on what other good courts have done and other good writings and put them together to make what we think is a, a sound decision on something new, courts want to do that rather than just think up something brand new on their own. And because it's me, we got to have one Latin phrase in here. This phrase called stare decisis. It just means that if there's nothing new presented, we're going to stand by whatever the previous decisions have been about this subject. So unless you have new information, new evidence, new circumstances, or there's been some major change in the social order, we're going to lean towards keeping things as they have been. And that's all starry decisis means. But that's a principle that judges, especially Supreme Court justices, tend to favor, even whether they decide to take a case or not. If they think the way it is is good enough, they may not even take the case to discuss it. Or they may take the case because they think they have an opportunity to add to our knowledge about that legal problem. 
So they're really not looking to get your car fixed. They're looking for larger issues about public safety, public welfare, uh, national responsibilities. So I want to leave you with one particular thought, maybe that ought to lay underneath anything legal that you read, whether it's a court case or an article about court, or just you read a crime story on Yahoo News. Something for you to think about. This phrase, let justice be done though the heavens fall, really traces its roots all the way back to ancient Rome and has been used by judges pretty much continuously since the 1600s. So if the idea is a couple thousand years old and we've been using it on this continent for about 400 years, it must mean something. So I give you the statue of Lady Justice and there are three things that I would draw her atten your attention to. First, of course, she has a sword, meaning that justice can enforce punishment. So, yes, people could be fined or have to pay the other guy who they harmed or have to go away for a while because they did something bad. But the sword represents delivering justice. OK. The scales that she is holding means that Justice takes into account the balance between these different ideas. So even the guy that his tree fell on my car, he gets a chance to make his argument too. So he gets to present his ideas and gets to have his lawyer and present his photographs. And then I get to do the same thing so that each side gets a fair chance to put their stuff out there. And then whoever has the most evidence, the most true facts, ought to win. You may not see it very well in this particular picture, but in every statue that represents justice, she is blindfolded. And that means that justice should not care who you are, where you come from, how much money you have, who your parents were, what you do for a job. None of that should make any difference. That being blind would make justice fair. So weigh the evidence, who's got the better argument, who has the most proof, that's the person who ought to win. And I don't care what side of town they came from, I don't care who their family is, just weigh the evidence and come down on the side of who had the more and better proof. So if our justice system works like it is supposed to, it should just be a fair measurement and hearing of both sides who bring out their information and whoever did that better and had the most ought to be the one who should win in a fair and honest situation. Obviously, in society, we don't agree about everything. And rather than punching each other in the mouth, we get our paperwork and we go to court and we argue in front of an impartial judge. And I think Understanding how that works is not just so that we understand these great historic writings and it's not so that um, we could all someday become lawyers. I think it also gives us just as citizens good information on how to behave correctly in our own lives and our interactions with other people. So that's why it's just beneficial to know a little something about this so that either you can keep yourself out of trouble or if you do get in trouble, you have some idea of how to get yourself out of it. I hope you found that useful and that it gives you a little bit of understanding so that when you have to read legal oriented literature, that this will be useful to your understanding.